Thank you for asking me to do this. <clears throat> so um, I apologize. Um, I'm going to need to to do some some reading here. I usually don't, but it's it's been a while since I I, I did this study, and I'd rather not um, talk off the cuff. So. Um, <clears throat> This paper discusses the results of historical and archaeological research to document and understand the role of Mexican miners in the California gold rush. The research is framed within a Marxist theoretical perspective that seeks to understand conflict as an expression of an economic mode of production and a legacy of a specific historical context. The historical context, therefore, begins with European colonization efforts beginning in the 15th century focuses on the roles of England and Spain in the Americas and follows their legacy into the mines of the Sierra Nevada foothills. The study also presents an assemblage of materials one might find at Mexican minor sites. This assemblage is predicted from teasing out clues about their material culture from the historical record as well as archeological remains at Mexican sites from different time periods in different regions. Finally, assumptions that had caused archeologists to dismiss studying Mexican miners are tested by focusing archival and field research at a site in the Sierra Nevada foothills that oral history maintains was occupied by Mexican miners between 1848 and 1852. At the end of the day, I hope to make more people aware of this ignored population and to spark interest in this topic for further historical and archeological research. This topic is particularly relevant to contemporary issues, not only regarding the complex social relations <clears throat> of between Mexican labor and US capital, but also how relationships of conflict are formed, perceived, and perpetuated by those involved. So first off, location. Uh, among the first individuals who came to participate in the gold rush were miners from the Northern states of Mexico. The majority of Mexican miners in California concentrated in the geographic area known as the Southern Mines for the Southern gold mining region here on this map, which today includes Amador, Calaveras, Tuolumne, and Mariposa counties. At the time of the gold rush, <clears throat> the United States had just signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And this treaty ended the war, ended a war that was the culmination of conflicts that cemented Mexican and American national identities in opposition to one another. In the first years of the gold rush there, however, there seemed to be enough gold for everyone. So hostility did not permeate the population nor did it dictate government action. Gold was easily prospected, lending to a feeling of common industry and good fortune among the miners. See here, everybody's having a good time. <clears throat> there were pockets of bigotry and calls for expulsion of Mexicans early on, but it wasn't until competition for the increasingly Increasingly scarce mineral grew more and more fierce that expulsion and exploitation of Mexicans advocated on a large scale. Many resented the fact that Mexican miners were highly successful in the mines. <clears throat> this resentment, which was fueled by competition and fanned by leftover racism from the war made Mexicans a target. The experienced miners, Mexican miners, constituted a form of formidable comp competition to the economic success of miners. The mining tradition in Mesoamerica preceded European colonization. As a result of colonization, then, mining became a great source of wealth for Europe and became technologically driven. When the Republic of Mexico gained its independence from Spain, Mexico was still a supply center for the world economy. The individuals who formed the body of mining labor in Mexico were mestizos and Indians. Some of these miners labored through the hacienda system as peons. Others were called gambusinos, free miners who followed the discovery of placer deposits throughout Northern California. 
These mining centers attracted not only miners, but also supported a microeconomy that included cooks, laundresses, bakers, merchants, suppliers, mule skinners, prostitutes, musicians, gamblers, and barkeeps. When news of the discovery in California, <clears throat> there's the mule skinners. When news of the discovery of gold reached Northern Mexico in 1848, these individuals packed their tools of trays and simply headed toward the newest diggings in Alta California. In addition to Gavacinos, some Mexicans who mined in California did so in labor parties organized by wealthy individuals known as patrones. Both groups were instantly and abundantly successful at extracting gold. And it wasn't just the miners who fared well. Mexican muleteers who charged the least for freight quickly monopolized the business. Mexican women made small fortunes selling food and dealing cards. Mexican merchants <clears throat> made a steady income selling goods. They did very well on the gold rush in 1848. In 1849, they came to California in greater numbers to continue their successful ventures. This was quickly dubbed foreign capitalism. An alarm was exacerbated by rumors that these groups would make off with millions of dollars to fill their coffers of the homeland. As easily accessible gold diminished, animosity toward Mexicans and other foreigners grew into violence, exploitation, expulsion from the mines, and from Mexicans retribution for these acts. The most publicized <clears throat> examples of these are the hanging of a Mexican woman in Downeyville, the exploits of Joaquin Murrieta, the first foreign miners tax, and the organized expulsion from the town of Sonora in Tuolumne County. These are topics for another paper, but the point is that Mexicans were treated by others and perceived by themselves as a distinctive group. This social distinction may help us as archaeologists to distinguish their living and mining sites from others. Now on to Laura Calaveritas, the historical research. Oral history indicates that the location of the Mexican mining camp known as Lower Calaveritas is approximately three miles south of the town of San Andreas in Calaveras County, California along the north and south sides of Calaveras, Calaveritas Creek. Oops. <clears throat> One mile west of Calaveritas. This is Calaveritas, also known as Upper Calaveritas, which still contains standing adobes and is identified as a state landmark. This area has seen little to no development since the 1850s. Historical research was conducted to determine whether a Mexican population could be identified as associated with the Mexican camp of Lower Calaveritas and to establish a chronological sequence of events related to the research area. Limited archaeological fieldwork was conducted to determine if surface features and artifacts present at the location of the mining camp could verify the existence of the miners. Oral tradition holds that Lower Calaveritas was established in 1849 by Mexican miners. It had a reputation as a wild and dangerous place that along with nearby Yaqui camp became a hangout for criminals. A historical, historical account by Leonard Noyes recalls in 1850 that he sold a deer to a camp of Mexicans a few miles south of San Andreas. And later in 1851, he was helped across Calaveritas Creek by a group of Mexicans who had camped there with a, a pack of mule, tra uh, with a train of pack mules. Unfortunately, analysis of historical public documents indicates that specific miners who established their camp at Lower Calaveritas in the early years of the gold rush remain elusive. Documents before 1860 are scant and vague and the Mexican population had begun to move on by that time. The decline of the Mexican camp of Lower Calaveritas may be tied to the events in the early 1850s that alienated Mexicans socially, including the expulsion of Mexicans from the area in February of 1853. 
Any additional information about the site will probably only be found through archaeological excavation. I want to point out on this uh, census, this is very common um, for uh, the census takers to merely identify individuals as Mexicans. Um, this is common also with Chinese during this period, so they weren't given um, individuality. Um, and here you see the population of Tuolumne County and the non-native population is, um, well, the U.S. is there, but the, the majority of non-native people in uh, 1850 was from Mexico and then it, it changes quite a bit and it declines drastically over, over the next 40, 50 years. And then here down below, you see that um, the Mexican workers were primarily miners. So now we're gonna talk about the potential material legacy. An assemblage that might be found at Mexican occupation or mining sites was identified by combing through sources in the historical record and reviewing material studies conducted at a wide range of Mexican sites. These include items associated with mining, livestock, architecture, diet, dress, and personal effects, leisure and rec recreation, and religion and healing. These items should not be taken as distinct ethnic markers, but as potential evidence of Mexican miners that should be used in comparative analysis among sites supported with historical documentation and oral history. Physical remains associated with mining conducted by Mexicans may express themselves either as tools or features. <clears throat> Although the practice of entering into adits and shafts is not advisable, Mexicans would have constructed niches in which to place the figures of saints to protect them while working in the mines, such as those seen at Maloney's and the New Almazin mine. That was the previous slide. No other group of miners is known to have practiced this. However, if this is a Catholic practice, it would be expected from other Catholic groups. Hispanic hard rock miners working in deep mines also used a, what's called a denate. It's a, like a trump line, tump line. Um, a sack carried by the use of a tump line across the forehead to carry ore up and out of the mine for further processing. These were probably made of, an avail of any available material that was strong yet flexible, flexible, but the preferred material was leather. Within the mine, ladders formed by notched poles would indicate Hispanic miners as well. These techniques are known to have been used historically in Mexico, at Carson Hill in Calvary, Calaveras County <clears throat> in the early 1850s, and also in Virginia City at the Mexican mine in the 1860s. This method of bringing out ore from the ground differs from that used early by Euro-American hard rock miners who before steam or electricity was employed to ho hoist ore up, to hoist ore up in ore carts, used a windlass or a whim. An empty bucket was lowered by turning a hand crank in the case of a windlass or by using a mule to turn the whim. The bucket was filled with ore in the mine and was hauled back up the same way it was lo lowered. Arastras also may indicate the presence of Mexicans, but as discussed earlier, um, they be quickly became adapted in a variety of settings throughout the West by many hard rock miners. The existence of an arastra can only mean that ore was being crushed, by whom must be defined by historical research. The use of arastras is indicated by the stone lined crushing pit itself as well as poles and drag stones, which should be large rocks if not used and worn smooth rocks with a drilled hole if used. Mexicans pre-crushed ore to feed the arastra. <clears throat> Pre-crushing was conducted by hand with a heavy mallet or with a more elaborate ore crusher made 
by fastening a boulder with a wooden fork and placing this fork and boulder in a notched tree trunk like shown here. A mortar of stone was prepared and the rocks were placed in the mortar and the boulder attached to the fork was raised up to let fall and crush the ore in the, mor in the mortar. Physical remains of such a device should probably be associated with Erastris and would today likely be expressed by the mortar and the crushing boulder, both which should have evidence of heavy and repeated impacts. Although not reported in California, Mexicans also used what they call an ingenio, which is a machine similar to a stamp mill. Um, no, I don't have that. Um, this device used water to drive a square wooden pillar stamp up and down in a square stone mortar to crush ore. It probably would have required more iron components than the arastra, as well as the construction of a water wheel and the proximity to water. These limitations may be the reason they are not seen by gold rush diarists and why they may not have been used in California, especially in the Southern mines where water was less abundant than in the Northern mines. As well as crushing, the mining of deep ores by any group of individuals would also require refining, such as with mercury amalgamation to catch free gold or smelting to burn off sulfides. Smelting was practiced by Mexicans, but is not reported in any of the historical documents concerning mining in California, except at Cerro Gorio near Owens Lake, which is far south and over the mountain. Where smelting may have occurred, it would be indicated mainly in the form of smelting ovens, <clears throat> slag, and bellows. Ovens were usually built on a stone or brick base with a dome of adobe, though variations may have been employed according to available resources. Mexicans used the barra, a straight metal bar with a pointed end for both hard rock and plaster mining. This seems to be one of the items most likely to indicate the presence of Mexican miners. Uh, although Chileans may have used the barra, they are most frequently associated with the use of a shorthanded pick. The use of the barra does not seem to have been acquired by any other group in the mines either. Also indicative of Mexican miners is the cuerno, a scoop made of a cow's horn. These were used for digging and for settling the heavy particles of gold, like a, like a gold pan, either with the aid of water or with wind by throwing them up in the air. Of course, the batea, a shallow conical wooden bowl was also used for this purpose. Mexican sluice mined using muslin stretched over a frame of wooden stakes set into the ground with a board placed on the downhill side of the muslin acting as a riffle. I apologize, I'm using a lot of mining terms that, that I haven't um, introduced. Although the remains of this particular device may not preserve, it is important to consider these Mexican sluicing methods because other evidence of the technique, pits dug into the ground, piles of rocks arranged down a hillside and short ditches that brought water to the works are not considered an activity conducted by Mexicans, but they might be. Livestock associated with Mexican miners were primarily mules, but also, um, but they also had horses. Uh, tack associated with horses used by Mexicans is described as including gold and silver plated saddles bridles and spurs. Not all tack was likely gold or silver plated all however, but the non-perishable items associated with tack may bear motifs symbolic of Mexican culture, including conchas, which are shells, um, a decorative concave plate representing a shell. Mexican tack differed in design from their Euro-American counterparts and tack bearing such distinctions may indicate a Mexican presence. For example, saddles, Mexican saddles are known to have particularly large horns and Mexican motifs bear symbols of Moorish designs, such as the star and crescent often seen in the spade bit. 
In addition, Mexican spurs often had relatively large rowels, which are these things. And saddles often had square rather than round skirts. Other Mexican tack include lariats made of plated rawhide and twisted horsehair reins called mecates. Mexican muleteers used a host of accoutrements also in their trade. Their packing began by laying a blanket over the back of a mule. The blanket was a horsehair filled leather pad with attachments built into it at specific points for tying the pack. Besides tack, other livestock associated items that might be found at Mexican miners and sites include mule shoes and corrals, likely built by placing poles into the ground at close intervals. Corrals would reveal themselves today by the presence of post holes in dark organic soil left by animal dung, which can be chemically tested to determine its contents. The construction of adobe buildings seems to be the most indicative physical evidence of Mexicans participating in mining activities. Adobe construction was used in unlikely places such as Fort Churchill and some Pony Express stations in Nevada, leading Dr. Hardesty from UNR to be skeptical, skeptical of the association of this method of construction with Mexicans. However, the high number of adobe buildings in the Southern mines in relation to the Northern mines, which correlates well with population demographics, offers strong evidence that adobes in the gold mining region were primarily conducted, constructed by Mexicans. Nevertheless, it should not be assumed that all adobe structures were built by Mexicans. Both physical and documentary evidence should be used to determine both the builder and owner of specific adobe structures. Adobes were typically built with a stone foundation approximately two feet high and adobe brick walls approximately two feet thick and covered with a white lime based plaster. Few adobes remain standing today, but their remains should be evidenced by stone foundations covered with adobe melt, which is dirt, <clears throat> and associated with machine cut nails from the wood construction of ceiling joists, door frames, and roof trusses. Other Mexican built structures are less likely readily apparent today, but the remains of wattle and daub structures found at hedges provide a guide to identifying those types of structures as well. And this is an example of a wattle and daub um, structure, also called a hakal. And um, this is this is this was what was found archaeologically in a place, and this is, this is actually my ancestors from Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, another remnant of the Mexican built environment is the plaza, which is a feature evident in some some Sierra Nevada foothill towns that Mexicans established, such, such as Sonora and Hornitos. At a larger scale, the Mexican built environment may differ from that of their Euro American counterparts in terms of location. After the first few years of the gold rush, Mexicans, because of their marginal status within the society, established camps and towns away from major thoroughfares in somewhat out of the way locations. Lower Calvaritas, for example, for example was situated along a well used creek, but away from two major thoroughfares. It had no road through it and may have been enclosed by a stockade. Jesus Maria, Vallecito, and Campo Seco were other Mexican towns that were established away from the major flow of traffic up and down the mines. Hornitos is, the, is one of the southernmost mining towns and is quite isolated from other population centers. Diet. <clears throat> Previous archaeological research and historical accounts both indicate that Mexican miners maintained a traditional diet. Women played an important role in maintaining this diet as they accompanied men to the mines and cooked for them. Gardens were planted and maintained to provide fresh vegetables and may be evidenced by dark organic rich soil. Tortillas of flour and corn were made and corn was ground for this purpose on Mexican patates 
made of vesicular basalt. One such metate is displayed at the Calaveras County Archives. It's rectangular in shape and supported by three legs, two that support the lower end and one that supports the higher end. A rectangular shaped vesicular basalt mono was used in conjunction with the matati, which is different than what's shown here. Um, other grinding devices would include a mocajete, right here, which is a bowl mortar also made of vesicular basalt and supported by three legs. Examples of these bowl mortars <clears throat> are exhibited at its historical museum in Murphy's. The metare and mocajete were items that would have been brought from Mexico and through the study of basalt sourcing might be tied to a specific origin. Outdoor ovens and hearths were used to prepare food and might include botanical remains such as beans, corn, pepper, and green chili seeds or thorns of the nopal cactus. This, these are chili seeds here. Rathias were cooked on any flat surface, but the cast iron comal, a round griddle, or um, a, a pottery comal was used in this process. Can put some things out of order. Um, outdoor ovens constructed, this is the, uh, um, Specific pottery. This is called uh, galera. It's a lead, lead-based um, pottery um, that also may be evident there. And this is called buffware. Outdoor ovens constructed and used by Mexicans may vary. Because Mexicans use traditional adobe construction in California, their ovens probably were constructed in a traditional manner in an adobe or stucco dome over a stone base. There were a lot of these um, found in, um, let's see, there are a lot of these were, were constructed near the town of Hornitos, which is why it's called um, Hornitos, little ovens. Other food-related items that may indicate Mexican occupation are Mexican lead glaze, polychrome earthenware, buffware, and bottles manufactured in Mexico. Pepper sauce and spice containers have also been found in relatively high numbers at Mexican minor sites. Faunal remains that include boiled bones, boiled bones, and the lack of bone-in cuts may also be part of the dietary assemblage of Mexican miners. Beef was certainly an important protein source among Californios and may have been prevalent among Northern Mexicans as well. Mexicans were distinguishable in the mines by their dress. The, of course, these guys are pretty dressed up. The soils of the southern, southern, southern Sierra Nevada are not as acidic as those found in Northern Sierra Nevada. Therefore, natural fibers that Mexicans wore, such as cotton and wool and sandal material, may be found in archaeological deposits in the southern mines. Certainly, non-perishable items of their clothing may present themselves as evidence of their passing. These items might include the leather soles of sandals, buttons that was once fastened the outside of a man's pants, gold and silver thread and women's earrings, brooches, or the comb to hold a mantilla called a beineta, which is what she's wearing here that holds up that. <clears throat> Items associated with the time Mexicans spent at leisure or recreation may include tobacco plugs, matchstick holders, liquor bottles, portions of musical instruments, and Mexican currency. Amphitheaters, used for bullfights and bull and bear fights might still be a place of community gathering, which might be explored through oral tradition. Physical remains associated with religious practices of Mexicans assumes a maintenance of Mexican Catholic beliefs that combined indigenous beliefs with Spanish Catholicism. This aspect of Mexican miners in California is mentioned very little in the historical record but indicates the use of flowers and crosses 
as a continued expression of religious celebration and devotion. These symbols may have been created in informal settings, such as engravings in trees at camps. The use of figurines of saints may also have been used as indicated in the niches within the new Almaden mine in San Jose. At Carson Hill, wooden crosses were used in the same type of niches, indicating that figurines of saints may not have been as available on foothills. Altars or niches may also have been placed within domestic or commercial structures. Rosaries and crosses must have been carried and worn, but as items that were highly symbolic and important to Mexicans, they would have been safeguarded and might ha not have been either discarded or lost and thus may not appear in the archeological record. Few discussions of religious practices in general appear in the historical record. Likewise, literally no discussion of healing practices appears in the historical record. Fred Cuno from Upper Calvaritas indicated that a curandera, a Mexican healer, lived in Upper Calvaritas, but he did not know anything of her practices or tools of trade. These are areas of research that beg further study, but that might need to be conducted through ethnographic study, requiring the survey of previous and existing mining, Mexican mining communities and the use of Mexican informants. Okay, on to the archeology. span The archeological study at Lower Calvaritas consisted of an intensive pedestrian survey. One site, Cal 01, <clears throat> can, um, was identified at the location oral history indicates was the Mexican camp at Lower Calvaritas and was therefore subject to more intensive recordation of its several features, including metal detection and investigation of positive hits and select probing with a quarter inch diameter metal bar. Here's Mexican, Lower Calvaritas, and then there's Upper Calvaritas. Time sensitive artifacts at, found at, Cal 01 can be dated as early as 1850, indicating that this site dates to the appropriate time period. These include one black bottle finish from feature J and one olive glass bottle finish from feature G. The bottle from feature N appears to be a champagne bottle with a heavy coating of patina and a laid on ring finish, laid on ring. A slight horizontal mold seam is evident around the shoulder of the bottle, but this is not as time di diagnostic, diagnostic as the other two bottle fragments. Black glass bottles like the one from feature J here were imported from England and are often associated with circa 1850 mining sites. This bottle is either <clears throat> a brandy or ale bottle that would have included a cork stopper with a wire bale closure. The artifact from feature G exhibits a crudely laid on ring and a thin body indicating a hawk style wine bottle that dates from the 1850s to the end of this, the century. Very sparse archeological data. The most prominent features at the site consist of sluice mining areas, features C and J and a large fireplace um, and an oven. So here's the ground sluice. And this is, uh, we'll talk about this. Sluice mining is represented by features C and J. The sluice portion of feature C takes advantage of a naturally occurring substantial quartz outcrop. So this is the sluice area where they would have run, run the water through. Associated with feature J is a ditch that diverted water from a larger canal upslope. Feature G is the remains of a very large stone fireplace within which one of the glass bottle fragments from the period was found. Feature H is the remains of a collapsed stone oven investigated by Julia Costello in 1984. 
No artifacts were found within the oven, which is common because they were consistently kept clean, but the structure itself was documented. The oven was D-shaped and built on a one foot high square foundation off the ground. The oven may represent an outside kitchen area associated with features E and G. Feature M is a large flat excavated into the hillside on which are situated the remains of a large structure represented by a mud mortared rock foundation. It's this here. The walls of which are two feet wide. The location of this structure may coincide with a store owned by a French merchant in 1856. The structure was a property approximately 40 feet by 22 feet and open toward the creek. The flat includes a separate walled area in the back of the structure, approximately 13 by 22 feet. Also attached to the east wall of the structure was a 13 by 10 foot room represented by a dry laid rock foundation. This foundation, the walls of this foundation were partially obscured by eroded dirt indicative of adobe wall melt, which is this kind of slump there. Fallen structures within walls built entirely of stone leave much more rock debris in the interior of the structure than this does and do not leave the same distinctive berm over the remaining wall. The berm was probed with a quarter inch diameter metal bar to determine if there were rocks underlaying the surface soil of the berm. And it indicated that the berm was all dirt except for the rock wall portion. Between the outside walls of the structure and the excavated hill to the north, there was a, a ditch here that would have allowed the diversion of water away from the structure, adding further evidence that this structure was built of adobe. The front of the structure includes a four by 22 area where the foundation walls are not obscured by an earthen berm indicating perhaps a wood covered porch. Artifacts discovered on the surface near feature M include machine cut nails um, and fragments of cast iron. An intense concentration of subsurface metal was detected in a wide area in front and downhill of the structure. So recommendations for further research. Much of the literature on Western mining addresses the arrival of capitalism in the mines. The implication of this work is that prior to this time, the mines were driven by a non-capitalist economic system. The historic context of Mexican mining clearly shows that Mexicans and others toiled and prospered within economic systems in conflict with capitalism. Defining these economic modes of production and understanding how the process of economic change affects social perspectives of self and other is a benefit of studying this population. The topic of Mexican miners is particularly relevant to contemporary issues, not only regarding complex relations between Mexican labor and US capital, but also how relationships of conflict are formed, perceived, and perpetuated by those involved. The current pattern of Mexican mig migration to and from the US is in part a continuation of a long history of resource exploitation that can be documented as, per, as early as the first half of the 19th century. What has changed through history is the relationship Mexican labor has had to the means of production. One way to address issues of conflict is to explore relationships as a diachronic dialectic, a symbiotic organism rather than two separate combatants. Standard academic treatment of distinguishable groups as others perpetuates the idea that a group's differences form the basis of conflict. Writing about racism against Chinese in the mines, one historian states that, quote, their distinctive appearance, cultural separateness, and cohesion made them gradually targets for outbursts of anti foreign sentiment. This per perspective subtly blames the victim for the crimes committed against them. Other academes address the economic basis for conflicts in terms of competition 
without delving into the complex historical and political relations inherent within the overarching economy. <clears throat> Perhaps it's time to consider conflict as an expression of relationships. If the relationship is the focus of the study, groups are given equal status as significant parts of the whole and the workings of the relationship come into focus. Such a study places each partner on an equal footing, which moves away from blaming one or the other. There are challenges to studying this population. Uh, the transient nature of the historical population and the lack of consistency in documenting events in the early years of California statehood can be substantial challenges in associating specific individuals or groups with site-specific material remains. Census records, land exchanges, contractual agreements, and the host of other types of legal documents do not approach a level of trustworthiness in this region until at least 1860. These challenges are particularly relevant for the Mexican population who in 1852 were not even identified as individuals in the census. Furthermore, the archeological record is muddied by the cycles of reuse typically associated with mining locales. This pattern tends to obscure or destroy the early and less technologically driven periods of use. Although there are challenges to studying Mexican miners at any time in history, those challenges are the greatest during the early years of the gold rush. Often when conducting land title research, the historian attempts to fill in the missing pieces by attacking from both temporal ends, the earliest point and the latest and eventually is able to piece together a coherent chronology. The same method is recommended for continued archeological and historical research on Mexican miners. Research on Mexican miners should be conducted in repositories outside of California, such as New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and Mexico. And a comparative base of archeological research needs to be established starting with later and more established populations. Because of the ambiguity faced with early historical records, the more fruitful avenue of research, at least in this early stage of data gathering, is more likely to be at locations where historical documents can positively confirm that Mexican miners lived. To date, the most successful archeological investigations of ethnicity and class have come from sites where individuals who live there are known and data concerning their livelihood and culture are accessible. As such, studies of this population will require devotion to comparative research throughout the region. The initial focus should be locations where Mexican miners congregated after the crises of <clears throat> the foreign miners tax of 1850 and the Murrieta scare of 1852, 1853, and after legal documents become more consistent. Some of these towns include Hornitos, Gadecito, Camp Seco, and Jesus Maria. Hornitos is especially enticing because it has retained its historical integrity and setting. In addition, its built environment, as well as the transportation route through it, has not been subject to gold rush development. Gold rush era research <clears throat> should not be disregarded, however. Like the historian, archeologists need to work at the puzzle with all possible pieces. A potentially fruitful study could focus on semi-secluded locations dating to <clears throat> Gold Rush with oral history or historic accounts of Mexican population combined with a comparison of general Gold Rush period sites or a study of local merchants to develop a context for the supporting services of minor populations. <clears throat> this shows, um, this is basically Highway 5, Highway 99. This is Hornitos, it's still like in the middle of nowhere. Um, and this is a close up of the town. It hasn't changed much, and there's evidence that there was even a little plaza there. Yeah. The end. <laughs> <laughs>